Beloved congregation, those who may be visiting with us this morning, we hear the call to worship in Psalm 84 this morning. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. People of God, dearly beloved in Christ and dearly beloved of your servant, we are glad to be back in your midst after a needed vacation. We are renewed. We trust that you are as well. And we continue in doing this one principal thing as a congregation, worshiping the Lord. And we worship him because he's made the heavens and the earth and he has redeemed us by the blood of Jesus and indwelt us and he calls us to increased faith. We worship him in spirit and in truth. And from this great pursuit of worship, we shall never turn aside. May God bless us with graces to worship him with this benediction. Grace, mercy, and peace be richly multiplied unto every one of you and to all of us together. From God the Father, through Jesus Christ the Lord and his mediation, and in the communion of the Holy Spirit, amen. We sing now in our worship number 209. The psalmist in Psalm 84, our call to worship, extolled the loveliness of the tabernacle and he revealed that his soul was longing and even fainting for the courts of the Lord. He so desired to worship God in the communion of the saints. There's something similar to this in Psalm 105, and in this versification in 209 in the hymnal. Unto the Lord, lift thankful voices, come worship while your soul rejoices. Let's sing stanzas 1, 2, 5, and 6, 209.
The psalmist extols the law of God at every point in his in the revelation of God that's given to him. Psalm 119 in particular is a psalm of the law, not just the Ten Commandments, but of all of the precepts of God and of the entire Torah, of all that's recorded in the sacred writ. And so we can also extol the law of God and read it regularly so that we are reminded of great, great important truths with regard to our redemption. Number one, the law teaches us we are sinners, and we cannot avoid the condemnation that the law brings to us, our own hearts, as we stand and we're exposed by the law in all its purity. We're just sinners. And then, of course, we're led to Jesus Christ, That's the purpose of all the Word of God, to lead us to that Word. So we're exposed in our sin, we're led to the Savior. But then we have this way in the law of how to please God. This is His will, and thanks be to God. As God's people, we can begin to keep not just one, but all of the commandments of God. And this is why we're here. We want to know how to serve the Lord, to be different in the world, to be repentant and humble and holy Christians extolling God's salvation of us in Jesus. So let's hear. God spoke all these words saying to Israel, and God speaks all these words saying to Sovereign Grace Church, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me and showing mercy to those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. And our Lord Jesus himself summarizes all ten commandments, the complete will of God for our lives. These words, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul. And this is the first and the great commandment. Jesus says, and he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love God, therefore, and man who was made in the image of God. These two commandments, Jesus reminds us, hang all the law and the prophets. May God truly bless us. We've heard his word, having received his benediction, and been reminded that we are his people. And so for the knowledge of our sin, to be led to the Savior by faith and repentance of all our sin. So now we have a way in the Ten Commandments summarized into love God, love the neighbor, a way to live. Let us join together in this way of life. So let's sing now. Number 242, another psalm that extols the wonderful word of God of which we're going to be speaking in the preaching this morning. 
A versification of Psalm 119, let's sing the four stanzas, Lord, thy word to me remember. Wonderful that a psalmist could find the precepts of the Lord uh, worth meditating upon since they reveal to him so much of his sins. It's like uh, uh, groveling in a bad place and getting hurt all the time, and you know what I mean. It must be, though, because he finds that God blesses him in his meditation upon, of all things, commandments and precepts. He finds Jesus, and we must find Jesus. That's the purpose of this word, dear ones, the purpose of the word of God. Know Jesus, the word. Our sinfulness, our sorrows, our losses, our crosses, our hurts, in our successes, to the word, to the word our peace, our comfort, salvation, our life. So we're reminded of that as we go into prayer together. And now the Lord's sending the rain. Beautiful. And may he send us blessing too as the rain pouring out of heaven as we pray together. I do want to make this reminder or just to, uh, I've just been told this from Al, Sharon's nephew, drowned yesterday and uh, we want to pray for her as he as she comforts and is comforted among the bereaved and for Al as well as to leave right after church and, and care for his wife and family we've had other losses in our congregation and we think of them we think also of the celebrations that we can engage in anniversaries birthdays, all the ways that God blesses us and reminds us, people of time, he's ours. The times are in his hand. Let's pray. Heavenly God and Father, our Lord, our Savior, your words are pure and they're tried as silver in the furnace seven times and your words are never found wanting. Thanks for your words, everyone. Words revealed in the Bible, words in your beautiful creation, a glorious and most elegant book of Revelation itself. Words you speak in history, all these words you speak to reveal yourself And you remind us especially in a big way 
to think upon you revealed in Jesus. And Lord, we are so grateful for that word that you've spoken. And now, as you give us faith in him, and you work even in little hearts, four-year-old hearts, and you work in marriages, and you work at funerals, and you work at good times and in bad, you're reminding us to go to the word. And that we live out of the word. And we need rain. And we're so thankful for rain and sunshine and all the good gifts of the earth. We're so thankful for your creation, for grand canyons and Yosemites and our backyard, front yard, flowers. Especially we're mindful and thankful for the gospel word. And it all... In all the written word you've given, you've spoken good news. You've spoken more than wrath. And instead of wrath, you've showed us that you remember mercy. So we pray, Lord, in light of the word as a congregation, bless us with your mercy for the sake of Jesus, all for his sake. As we come together and worship as a congregation, and we seek to hear the word of God. Help us to understand it. Help us to be humble before the word of God. And to gladly receive its ministry, even though it's through a weak and sinful man. Lord, you have ordained even foolish things like preaching and sacraments for a people that might be built up in the wisdom and the grace of God. Lord, remember everyone, those with us, those who could not be with us, those who are walking uprightly, those who may be walking in sin. Lord, bless our fellowship, our communion, our family at Sovereign Grace Church. May we desire her peace and pursue it. May we speak with one another of the things that we love and hold dear and which we long to manifest here in one of the great congregations of this world, a true church of Christ. We pray, Father, bless us in all our way as we receive children, as we live life without children in marriage, or as you bless us with one or two or ten. Bless, Lord, us in our single life, in our young life, in our child life as babies. Bless the young people. Bless the elderly. Bless the widows and the widowers. Bless those who've endured losses of late, sometimes of unbelievers, sometimes of those who've died in the faith. And bless Sharon now and Al by her side and the family as they mourn the loss of a nephew and son. God have mercy. And give, Lord, the courage to believe the word, even in these things, and to leave these things with the Lord. What a great and great and glorious and constant comfort we have as we hear in our own catechism, our only comfort in life and death, a great comfort indeed, is that we're not our own. We don't belong to sin. We don't belong to Satan. We don't belong to circumstances. We belong to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, body and soul, now and forever. And Lord, we can be assured of these things, but so often we live as if we're not. The Word of God doesn't have the meaning it ought to in our lives, though in itself it's very meaningful. In other words, we listen to and, and other things we think about except the gospel word and the things of praise and this is to our shame, and this is so often born of unbelief or pride and self-serving spirit, and we're sorry. Indeed, all the commandments of God have convicted us once again of our need of a Savior and of how precious his blood is in which we trust. Bless each and every one, all of us in our pilgrim's path, continue, we pray, to bless the congregation here. We may be a church 
that we may be a way station for some and a resting place for others, a place indeed of truth and of love, of humility and grace and righteousness, and of all the things that you would reveal where two and three are gathered together. Comfort our sorrowing hearts. Keep us, Lord, humble. Guide us to be faithful. And bless us all together, because Jesus, our head, is the head of the body he has made us to be. Amen. Your offering at this time for the general fund will be received. Let's sing again, number 17 in the Psalter hymnal, a versification of the psalm on which we'd meditate for a few moments this morning. Help, Lord, for those who love thee fail. Let's sing the five stanzas, number 17.
continue our summer series of sermons on the Psalms. And we began last year and finished or went through uh, Psalms 1 through 11. And as I reminded you then and will remind you now as we go into the to other Psalms, uh, this uh, meditation, these meditations on the Psalms into which I would lead you are real uh, just cursory or they're kind of like a survey of the Psalms. There's a lot more that could be said, but I do want us to become well acquainted with them. But this through a survey. So sometimes we'll take whole Psalms like Psalm 12, to which let's now turn Psalm 12. And we're going to read all of the verses, verse 8, and take this as a whole. And the subheading reads, To the chief musician on an eight-stringed harp, a psalm of David. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak idly, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips and a double heart, they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things, who have said, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own, who is Lord over us. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth. Purified seven times, you shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked prowl on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. Thus far, we read God's word. The Psalms occupy a unique place in the canon of the scripture. Every book of the Bible is the Word of God, that to be sure. Every book of the Bible is the Word of Christ. God would speak to us in the beginning and in all of history and in the end. One thing he has to say, and that is his pure son, Jesus. And so the Psalms we have seen are theocentric. They're focused on God And they're Christocentric, to use those big theological terms. They're focused on Christ, therefore. Or wherever God is, God is revealing himself in Christ. The uniqueness of the Psalms, however, is that the Psalms reflect on the work of Christ, God in Christ and his spirit in the hearts and in the lives and in the worship of the people of God. One has said that the Psalms are like a spiritual biography of the believer. And I believe that, don't you? And as we read the Psalms, we say, yes, that's, that is I. That's me right there. I'm lamenting with the psalmist. I'm confessing my faith with the psalmist. I'm exhilarated as the psalmist is. We, we can say that. We can identify the Psalms in a very real way, are for every man, that is, every believing man. The struggles of life, in the trials of life, in the successes and prosperity of being in God's covenant, in all ways the psalmist are very instructive for us and for our children as well. So God's word in Christ and uniquely revealed in the psalms as a God's word that comes through believers and their experiences as pilgrims and strangers in this earth. Psalm 12, strikingly, is God's word about words. From beginning to end, there is a prayer. Those are words of the psalmist. And there is a prayer with regard to the words of the wicked, which are like knives or spears that would assault the people of God and this psalmist in particular. And so there is this battle, this war of words that's going on here, and it seems as if 
the psalmist is going to melt under the heat of those accusations, as if the psalmist is going to be wounded mortally by the spears, which are those wicked words, until he, in the sanctuary, cries out, Help, Lord, very first word of our psalm, and finds solace, not in the words of men, but in the words of the Lord, which are set forth in this psalm as pure words. The words of the Lord are pure words. And so for such a time as this, we want to consider the words of the Lord. And we want to consider that over against the backdrop of the words of men. And then we want to consider the words that we ought to be speaking, the word of God that we ought to be rejoicing in and living by. So of words in lords and a few good men. I just go through the psalm with you, and there's nothing fancy about this, nothing complicated about this meditation. First of all, and also according to the psalm, the subject is the words of the ungodly. Note how the psalmist cries out, Help, Lord. Maybe some of you in your Bibles have translated, Save, Lord. That's the word. Save, Lord. For the godly man ceases, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men, and in their place are the ungodly who speak idly or vanity. Verse 2, everyone with his neighbor, and with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. So you note here the characteristic of the ones who have replaced the disappearing godly. The characteristic what uh, exemplifies who they are and what the lamentation of the psalmist is all about is the words, the words of the wicked. Idle words with his neighbor, flattering lips, and with a double heart they speak. Then the psalmist goes on to say, May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things. Who've said with our tongue, we will prevail. Our lips are our own, who is Lord over us. So you have here the sin of the tongue. And the psalmist, no doubt, knew of other sins of the ungodly, but he focuses on the sin of the tongue, of the words, children, that these people were saying. And to him, the words mattered. They weren't just things that didn't break his bones and therefore they didn't matter, but they mattered. They had weight to them. They were like barbs on a hook, those flattering lips. They were insults to God, those proud words. And so the psalmist is at wit's end, as it were, just about to die, perhaps, he thought. And so... Words And the Bible often tells us, doesn't it, that words are the problem of the wicked. They reveal to us that there is a problem inside, that is in the heart. In the Proverbs, doesn't it say that out of the heart are the issues of life? And indeed, the bad things come out of the heart of human beings through the tongue. And it defiles the man, and it speaks to us of where their love is or not, and what they're thinking upon, and so on. So you have, throughout the Proverbs, the sins of the tongue, the flattering lips, the proud words, and so on. They're all uh, lamented, and they're rebuked, and we're reminded that God will destroy those who so speak. And isn't it the case in that most practical book of the New Testament, if we want to say it that way, in the book of James, the New Testament Proverbs, there's a whole chapter given over to the sin of the tongue and warning the people of God who would be faithful not to speak just what's on their wicked heart, but to refrain from wicked words and for all their praising of God not to be found cursing men who are made in the image of God, maybe even in the church of Jesus Christ. So the sin of the tongue that's brought out here 
in three, four ways as something which we are to meditate upon for our edification. First of all, he speaks of people, everyone speaking idly with his neighbor. Now, that's a word that describes wicked words as empty, but not merely empty. Words are never merely empty. When they're empty this way, they're part of the vanity of Ecclesiastes, the emptiness that denies the significance of words and of time and of people and of God. They're deceptive words. That's the idea of speaking idly, everyone with his neighbor, not just shooting the breeze, but with a motive to avoid, perhaps, truth and confrontation, just to speak and while away the time, but again with this motive, and oftentimes the motive can be discerned, and so this is not what we're to be doing. That's what the psalmist is saying here. They rise up when the godly are not there speaking the truth in love, the ones who speak idle, everyone with his neighbor. And then flattering lips, closely related. Some have said like a twin sin of the tongue, speaking idly, everyone with his neighbor, but with flattering lips too, trying to boost up maybe a person's ego, but always to get something out of that person. Maybe to get uh, some kind of... Uh, understanding and a kind of friendship to win a person to one side. That's what a flatterer would do, maybe in the king's court. And so one, in, one who was a courtier of the king would want to advance and say, oh, king, my, you are looking so great today and, and so regal today, and aren't you a powerful man? Well, these are lamented in this psalm as sinners who also speak with a double heart. That word there, that Hebrewism, Hebraism, uh, literally means they speak with a heart and a heart. See how graphic the Hebrew language can be. People who speak with a double heart, we would say they speak out of both sides of the mouth. They're hypocrites, as one has described it. They're those who pretend one thing and who intend another thing. Others would describe them as they're one thing on Sunday and they're another thing on every other day. They're one thing when they dress up, they're one thing when they dress down. Another thing, an opposite thing. So these persons are all for duplicity, aren't they? That's a big word that means they're deceptive. There's double meanings in their life. They have a secret life, maybe, or but... Maybe the secret and the public can be known in just what they're saying right in front of you, and you can discern that. So all of this is speaking idly and flattering and with a double heart, but something to be known as well is that the tongue speaks proud things, this tongue that's being um, rebuked here. Verse 3, May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things. Well, proud things, well, that's like a self-flattering not different much from flattering another, is the proud things that a person boasts about that lift up himself. It's all about self, isn't it? And doesn't that remind us that the sins of the tongue are all about the devil? It's devil speak. The devil is the one who perverts truth and reality by the tongues of men. It could be by ministers, it could be by other officers, it could be by people in the congregation, and, and it could be as well that we're learning the way of the heathen. And so the Bible here speaks to us and to where we're at. The devil is behind all the wickedness, and that's not surprising, therefore, that the tongue of man in general now is launched against God, and also against God's people. That's the wickedness of it all. God speaks the truth in his word, and he would through his church, and the devil and those who are caught in the throes of the devil, they have something to say too. Always and invariably, it's to deny God and his truth and to disrupt a congregation. It's to 
undermine the truth that a congregation would live by and a minister would preach. That's what the devil goes about doing. And this is a restless evil, and this is born from the abyss of hell, the psalmist is saying to us here, and, and he's saying to, that, to, to us today. And it's all, amazingly, there's a kind of unity, just as the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Romans and the Greeks, who were always fighting one another, also with their words, just as they came together at the cross to say, we agree on this, Jesus must go, that's the case today. And this is manifest everywhere, isn't it? The sin of the tongue is manifest everywhere. The idle talk, the vain talk, the flattering lips, the proud speech, and, and the double heart, and so on. It's in all the news. Sadly, we don't have uh, many politicians that we can follow by what they say, do we? And those young people who are becoming more and more familiar with these things in the press, you're learning. You, you can't trust what is said on one day and what is said on another day. Well, this is just how it is in the philosophies of men. They're always speaking flattering lies, maybe boosting people up. This is the, the, the discoveries of science that are vaunted as the truth, even over against the word of God. And especially do the ungodly like to take shots at the Bible, don't they? And they like to say it's, it's all wrong. And so they'll speak these words, everyone to his neighbor, about what God has said in his word. And they'll say, ha, this is full of mistakes. And this is silly, isn't it? And when you go to the Grand Canyon, please don't see that as some kind of uh, remnant of what the Bible says is the flood and the great judgment. Oh, no. Look at the, Grand, uh, look at the uh, Colorado River. It's flowing right down there in the bottom. That is why there's a Grand Canyon, and it's eroding of the banks and so on. Well, people then, they see they're, they're denying truth. They're denying the Word of God. Same thing with the words that people come up with with regard to abortion, for example, in regard to the policies that are made in this country about abortion and, and the advancement of that wicked cause, the killing of infants in the womb. They'll say this, well, that's not a baby, they'll lie. They'll say it's maybe a fetus, certainly it's just tissue. You see what they're doing there? Playing with words. Or they'll call the abortion procedure, which is the mangling of the limbs and the tearing apart of the infant from the womb, they'll just call it a surgical procedure. And to those who would advocate the end of all abortion and murder in the United States and anywhere, they say, well, you're just robbing women of their reproductive rights. So the words are designed to flatter others who want their rights, to distort others from the truth of the situation that God makes babies and loves babies too. So... We have this, and we live in this. And especially when the church is assaulted. And the psalmist here, when he's speaking of the disappearance of the godly and of the faithful from among the sons of men, he's focused on the people he knows best. This is a psalm of David, and David knows Israel. David knows the society of the people of God. He lives among them. We don't know the occasion of this. It may be Absalom. When Absalom was seeking to win the hearts of the people of God, sitting in the gates and saying, I can do better than David, and David's a tyrant, and David's not fair, and so on. I don't know. We don't know what he's referring to here, but just as well. It could be any time, even in the church of Jesus Christ, and we must guard ourselves about that because, you know, we can't do a thing about it. The godly, they're helpless because, you know, at least they're helpless with regard to this war of words that the ungodly among them or outside of them do wage. We're helpless because we're not allowed to fight back that way. Don't step into the ring with a devil or someone who's caught up like a devil. You can't just fight back and 
they said this, and now we're going to say that, and we're going to ruin their reputation. That's not the Christian way. And so the godly feel helpless, don't they? We feel helpless. And so all the psalmist can do, one thing, help. Help, Lord. Save, Lord. I am exposed and vulnerable. And what they're saying is, yeah, in myself, I'm just a, a lout and a louse. But you're my righteousness. That's what he says. Well, the psalmist, in this psalm, is crying out in prayer and turning to the Lord. And that's what the, Lord, the godly do. So there's the words of the wicked. Here's the words of the Lord. Long about uh, verse 6, the psalmist even contrasts the words of the Lord with those of the wicked. And he says, the words of the Lord, Jehovah, are pure words. So pure, they're like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Now, let's try to understand that metaphor, that figure of speech. The psalmist is saying here that the words of the Lord are pure, and they're pure in themselves. We know that. They don't need anything to be added to them or anything to be taken away from them, like silver might. But he, he does say that they're like silver that's burned in a furnace, and so that all of the impurities has gotten away. You know, children, that's how God, or that's how people would go in those days with regard to, to precious metals, gold or silver. They would burn the silver that they'd find in a rock so that the rock would disappear and all of the, the iron or whatever else was in it. And all you had left at the end of the day when the furnace was heated up was the silver. Well, there might be a little that was left, so they'd burn it and they'd, they'd burn it more. Seven times, the psalmist says, and a number that indicates they'd they purify the silver as much as they could. But this is applied to the word of God, which we said is pure in itself and doesn't need a furnace to make it pure. But I think the idea here is that in the experience of the people of God, they've tried the word of God. They've, they've leaned on the word of God. They've heard the word of God. And they've found it just what God has said he would do or he promises. They found him faithful. That's the idea. And so you have this contrast here. The wicked speak idly and van vainly. Well, what is God? How does God speak? He speaks with significance. The opposite of empty is significant, is important, is true. The opposite of deceit is truth. That's what God speaks. That's the words of God. The people of this world, fallen in Adam, they believe the lie of the devil who questions the word of God. God never questions himself and his words may never be questions. His words are communications and revelations, purely, purely uh, reflecting the truth, the reality of everything. That's God's word. It's a revelation of truth. When God speaks, it's true. More than that, when God speaks, he's creative. Psalm 33, we read, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Genesis 1, In the beginning God said, Let there be light, and there was. And so God's words are true, and they're corresponding to reality, and they're creative, and, and they're saving they, they do something that's not destructive, but among the sons of the men, God, God, of men, God's word moves upon the person as his creative word moves upon the face of the ground, and they are created so that he comes and he speaks, and sinners are risen from the dead. That's the pure word of God. And then, when the godly hear God speak his promises, I will be with you. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. And when the godly lean on those promises in times of trouble, they find that the word of God is true. He helps them. 
So the psalmist here is speaking, uh, first of all, in, in rather desperate terms, help me, save me, and so on. But then he's rising up above the fray of the words, and, and he's calling a curse upon the flattering lips. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things, and so on. And then he expresses his confidence that God will do it. The words of the Lord are pure. You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. Now, people of God, there's one reason why we know, especially, the words of God are pure, are true, are saving, are the true revelation of things as they are and shall be. There's one reason we know that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. One reason we know that this is the book of the yea and the amen of God. And here it is, you know, it's Jesus. That's where the psalmist is led here in an Old Testament sort of way. He's led to confess that the words of the Lord are pure words and he's not going to focus on the dirt and the dross of humanity and they're speaking this and they're speaking that. That's Babel. That's Babylon. God, he speaks another word, his son. That's what the psalmist knows. And how much more do we in the New Testament in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him. And now we know in the beginning of the New Testament, there is God speaking so that He's with us. There is Jesus, the babe. There is the one who comes, and to behold Him is to behold the glory of God the purity of God, the way, the truth, and the life from heaven. There's the one who is ours in the fray, not just against words of them, but of words, our own words, and of our own sins. He's God's speech of grace to us at Sovereign Grace Church, to us poor sinners who are needy, who are ourselves proud, flatterers, and thankless. God's word is, I give my son for you. And I give my Holy Spirit, the spirit of my son to, to take you close to me. And through the mediation of the son, now from heaven, once crucified for our sins, but now from heaven, the spirit is poured out and we are taken personally into the communion of the Word of God. This can only mean that we're never the same. Have you been taken into the communion of God? It's a glorious thing. For you, does this word make sense? This Psalm 12 and what I'm saying here. The psalmist here is speaking to a, a very important aspect of society. On the one hand, there's what it says, and what it builds, and what it destroys, and what it stands for. On the one hand, there's this is MO, this modus operandi, this way of getting things done. Flattery, politics, campaigning, wrestling uh, through and getting your way. That's the world. Is that your way of getting things done? Is that our way? Is that what we're involved in? On the other hand, the Word of God. Pure words. So pure. So valuable. So precious to us that we read them that we submit to them, that we believe them, that we find our all in them, that our marriage ceremonies are centered around them, that in the funerals 
that we go to, we want to hear those words of hope. And in the preaching of the word of God, we want to hear what God says of Jesus. Is that where we're at? The psalmist makes a great contrast between those and, and the godly who seem to have disappeared. And that's the day we live in. Sometimes you can feel like Elijah, don't you? The time of Ahab. I'm the only one left. And God must assure us that there's a remnant, even 7,000 who've not bowed the knee to Baal and who love the pure words of God. Are we there with Elijah? That's the application of this text. You see, the psalmist speaks of a terrible time. The godly man was ceasing. The faithful were disappearing from among the sons of men. And uh, this appears to be his saying that they once were there. And they once were his familiar friends. And, and he went to church with them, maybe, or whatever. And, but now they're gone. And there's this fight, there's this battle, this, these words that are going on, and, and he's, he's lamenting this, and he's, he's desperate. And the temptation would be, I'm going to fight back with my own words, I'm going to just be nasty and mean, and so on. And Psalm 12 leads us to something more high, you see, and something pure, and something eternal, and something lasting, and something that's called the rock of our existence, and on which we stand. The pure words of the Lord, purified seven times. The promise, I will keep them. I will preserve them from themselves and from the wicked. I will preserve them from this whole generation that's given over to denying the significance of anything. That, by the way, is precisely what I heard and what we heard at my brother's funeral recently. We heard nothing and sounds signifying nothing. Words of men, lauding of a man, human kindness, humor, wit. Don't we need something more? Doesn't the church need a few good men who will stand on the word of God, who will know their own natural depravity and the tendency for all of us to hear a lie and to love a lie and not to hear the word of God and to love the truth and the honor of the neighbor? The church, in one point of view, and God, of course, doesn't need anyone. God will preach his word till the kingdom come and the last elect is gathered. God will defend and gather his church. He doesn't need us. But he uses us. And he says, where two and three are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them. There I am, the pure word of God. Jesus says this. And when you preach, I'm opening and closing the kingdom of heaven. And when you exercise discipline, and when you uh, administer the sacraments, there I am. This is my church. I will build my kingdom this way. Pure words of God. That's all we have. With the psalmist, we say, that's enough. That's my delight. That's my all, my joy. And of this word and these words of God, I will be confident. You too? Amen. Lord God, we pray you would bless us with your word. Help us, Lord, to stand strong on the word of God. Help us to speak the word of God. Love the word of God. Help us, Lord, to rebuke the lie and ourselves not to be involved in it, but ourselves to hear 
what is of praise and of good report, and to pursue the truth as it is in Jesus at all costs. We pray, Father, that you would unite us in this most holy word and in the most holy faith. You would continue to be with us and give us to be strong in the fray, in the battle of the, war, the, the words, knowing that the word of God will have the victory. Thanks for Jesus, your precious son, for forgiveness in him, the word of his blood, Thanks for the preaching of the gospel, unadulterated and coming from heaven and to our hearts and in our world. For Jesus' sake, amen. Continue in our worship, singing <clears throat> number 383, O oh, four thousand tongues to sing our great Redeemer's praise, one of the glorious new things that happens for sons of God who are born again. They want to speak the praises of the Savior, and they're not content even with one tongue. We want a thousand, because our great Redeemer is worthy of all the praise we can give him. Let's sing the five stanzas, or one, four, and five. One, four, and five of 383. After the benediction, we'll be singing the doxology printed in your bulletin, uh, number 309, 1 in 5. I do want to invite the visitors to join the congregation for lunch in the Kuiper Cafeteria after coffee in the narthex. May God bless us all in the communion of the saints. Receive God's parting word. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. of Sovereign Grace United Reformed Church. Sovereign Grace Church, served by the ministry of Reverend Mitchell Dick, worships each Lord's Day at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. at the chapel of Kuiper College, located at 3333 East Belt Line Northeast, between Three Mile and Four Mile Roads. You are most cordially welcome to join us for worship or visit us online at www.sgurc.org or contact us by phone at 616 Four zero six eight five six T. It is our prayer that the Lord would add His indispensable blessing to this ministry, in order that His name would be glorified through the edification of His people and the translation of sinners out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son.